Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Blanton. I'm a Calhoun County Master Gardener, and I'm also write the garden column um, for the Aniston Star, and I'm the Southern Gardener. This is a first for me. I'm talking to a camera instead of a room full of people, and I don't have all the Master Gardeners here to, ta to help me in case I get stumped. So we're going to see how I do just looking at a screen with my pictures on it. And if while I'm talking you have a question or a comment, please send them in because Teresa Kaiser, who is the, uh, will be our moderator, she will pass the questions to me. And I couldn't cover every tiny plant there was. So if you have a tiny plant that you know better uh, that you know better than I do, please send it on to us because I could only know the tiny plants I have in my yard. So we are going to start terrific tiny treasures. And I want to say before I started this, I do not have any special requirements to make something tiny like the flowers an inch big or the um or the plant only grows an inch tall, or there's something that makes it tiny. I looked more as it, it was charming, it was dear, it was small, it didn't depend a whole lot of attention. You could plant it under other shrubs, like things that do demand attention, like a camellia, a rhododendron, things that really they say, look at me. These are not look at me plants until you get up close and then you love them. So we'll get started and hopefully this will run just fine. Okay, we're first going to try to get uh, the clicker to go. It's on. Okay, let me, let me, okay. Operator error. I had it on off instead of on. Okay. I started with a quote. This is such a hard, hard time for everybody. And I know a lot more people are growing flowers. Lady Bird Johnson said, where flowers bloom, so does hope. I was just at Downing's and they were just about out of flower seeds. And she told me they had sold so many flower seeds. So I think we all know that when flowers bloom, there is hope. I, I always heard the expression, because I was always really short when other people weren't, that good things come in small packages, and that's kind of our thesis for today. The first is mouse ears hosta. I think this might be church mouse ears. I don't usually do good with little tiny hostas because they don't seem to be as vigorous, but I've had this one for years, and it's full grown, and you can see it's just a little tiny hosta in a little tiny pot, but I love the cobalt blue with the green flowers. I was really into collecting miniature hostas, and this is one of the first ones I got. It's called Stiletto, like the high heels, and that's a, it's a pretty tough little hosta, and I love it. I think I actually have two of them. So if you're looking for a small hosta, stiletto sets the bill. I really like this picture. Small is good since we do not all have this much extra space. We don't have room for great, a lot of us don't have room for great big trees, especially one that you can ride through, but everybody's got room for something tiny and terrific. Uh, Tiny plants can be fillers for small places where you might have a narrow place that you just need to put a little something. Tiny plants are great for container gardens and also they're great to layer under larger plants. And this is what I have done in my yard. I have layered up my camellias and then I've planted little gardens underneath them and here I've got uh, some ferns, some Japanese anemones, some epimediums, and some smaller dwarf Japanese maples. And so you can make more out of less and just changes the look of your yard. Now, a lilac is not necessarily a small plant, but the flower is so tiny and so delicate and smells heavenly. So I'm including this as a tiny plant because the flower is very dear, very, the little flowers are tiny. 
I really got into miniature daffodils one year, and I, I can't even tell you how many I bought. And most of them did pretty well. They, some of them may not have been quite as vigorous as the bigger daffodils, but the, it's a smaller version of a full-size daffodil. But the thing that's so neat about this little tiny daffodil is look how its face is upswept and the, the petals kind of sweep back. And I love that look when there are a lot of them and they're looking in one direction. They are the dearest little things. And anybody can plant a bunch of these, because I have. And you can, can you talk about a tiny plant without talking about a crocus? The sweetest, dearest little tiny plant, the harbinger of spring, almost lets you know that winter is gone and you go out and you find the first one and you're so glad because the squirrels didn't eat it. But a crocus is the epitome of a tiny plant. This is a new plant. This is actually a, a crocus that I took a picture of at Cane Creek. And it doesn't look like my crocus is at home. It may be the flower was a little bit bigger, so it's newer to me, and the, the petals are striped, but it, it was very striking. Now, this is another one that I got, and it's called Thomasina, or Tommy, and it is even tinier. And the one thing I learned about this in, in the literature is that it doesn't seem to be as appetizing to the crit critters that normally eat crocuses, which are squirrels. They love them. But I, I put out probably a hundred of these, and they won't bowl you over, but they are the dearest little plants. So that's a Thomasina or a Tommy, and it's a kind of a crocus. Hardy orchid. I love these. Uh, if you notice, the little tiny flower is the exact replica of a big orchid. Only this one's hardy, so that means it comes back every year. And another delightful thing about this plant is that it spreads greatly. So I had a lot of them that I've been able to give to people to try in their yards, but it's, it's got the most delicate little flower on it. And you can see it does look just like an orchid. Well, what can you say? You have to have ferns if you're going to have charming, tiny plants. Some ferns are bigger. I, I like this one. It's a lady fern, and it's one of my very favorites. And I, I, I am just like Hayes Jackson. Everything is my favorite, so you just have to excuse the word favorite over and over. I could say gorgeous, but that might get old. But I believe that this is the lady in red comes back faithfully every year. And this is great to layer under something else. I, now, lilies are not normally tiny plants. Most lilies, like Casablanca and some of the other lilies, have huge, huge, huge flowers. This one does not. It has smaller flowers, but there are more on a stem, and it, it's dear. A juga. A lot of people say, oh, a juga, ooh, that's just nothing. It just makes more, and I don't want that, and isn't it a, a invasive ground cover? No, it is not. It's a, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful little ground cover, and the flowers on it are quite lovely. I think this is a scallop a juga but I'm not sure. I went through a phase where I was collecting ajugas, and some were given to me without a label, and some of my labels are gone. But when you're looking for something tiny and something blue, ajuga's wonderful, and if it spreads too much, dig it up and share it with a friend. I love hookeras. My husband said, gee, they almost all look alike, but they don't. They come in so many colors, and I love this green one's called citronelle. But what is so charming about the hookerus is the little tiny flower. Teensy little flower, but yet one day we looked out, and there was a hummingbird flying around the flowers, just like stuck in midair, drinking out of those little tiny flowers. I could not imagine how, but my husband and I were just we stared the whole time it was there. It was like it was held on a string, 
But I do love hookahs, and I am one of the people that leaves the flowers on them. Now, here's another of the most charming of the tinies. Trillium is a little uh, native, and you can plant one, and all of a sudden you have them around your yard, but they're not an invasive plant. And the dark part in the middle is actually considered the flower. And I started collecting trilliums, but this one seemed to be the most hardy. I have one that's got a white flower on it that also seems hardy, but this, just the regular trillium is, just, is wonderful. Bloodroot. One of the master gardeners heard me drooling about her bloodroot, and she was kind enough to give me one. This bloodroot is a native flower, and it's planted at Cane Creek Community Gardens, and Linda McDaniel, who's the planter, I just said, could I have one of those? Because sometimes the best way to get a native plant is as a pass-along plant. So this, this is not mine. This is, this is the one at Cane Creek, but I'm looking forward to see what it does because it's a beautiful little flower. I love wild ginger. Wild ginger doesn't really have a very showy flower, but it is a beautiful ground cover, and you can put it anywhere in the shade, and it will make clumps, but it's not an obnoxious clump. It's, it's just a beautiful clump, and you can get them in a lot of different colors, but I think this particular one may be the most hardy. And yes, one time said, why don't you know the name of your plants? And I'd said, because I've lost all the labels and some of them have been out there 15 years and I'm past 70 and I don't remember. So please excuse if somebody knows the proper Latin name or botanical name for one of these, please pass it along. This is really, really one of my favorites. Hayes Jackson, Master Plantsman, introduced me to the world of epimediums. This is a little tiny flower. And if you can see, this one is splotched. So I started collecting them. And I, I've gotten several, but you, you can't walk into just any nursery and buy these. You have to get them online. And they're a little bit pricey but they are, so, they are so worth it. And I brought my yellow one, which is just as dear as it can be, and then this little white one. So I have about five and would love to have more when I'm not feeling cheap and caught in the pandemic. This is a great little flower. It's called Japanese anemone. And it is a hybrid of a Japanese anemone. It is a hybrid. There are all kinds of Japanese anemones. And this is one blooms in the fall. The only thing about it is it is, it is not an invasive plant, but it is very aggressive. The only other problem with it is the deer love it more than I do. And the deer stopped by yesterday, and they ate everything that would have bloomed. Now, before the tornado, I had one, and it rarely ever bloomed. The next year after the tornado, I had dozens and dozens and dozens covered with blooms. The biggest problem is that the deer love them. I went out this morning, and they'd been back, and I guess they thought, well, this is good. I'll have more. I love surprise lilies. Some people call them naked lilies, surprise lilies. But these are actually the surprise lilies. Uh, they come up, the foliage comes up and dies back down, and then it comes up on a stem. You know, I used to not love these, but I, I don't know. I've been seeing them in clumps, and I decided that this was something I loved. And last year, I actually bought some, and the black lubber grasshoppers ate every one. But I was pleased to see that the foliage came back this year. I just don't know if I'm going to have any flowers. It was a pink one. This is probably the loveliest of the lovely. This is a calla lily that I did not plant. It came up on its own. And every day I went out and took a different picture on it. I didn't plant an orange one. I had a white one, and it was on the other side of the yard. And all of a sudden I go out, and this is there. 
and the deer didn't find it, but Japanese maple, uh, uh, Japanese beetles ate that perfectly little round hole. Now, a lot of people do not like calla lilies because they represent funerals. But if they're out in the yard, step away from being funeral and just know that they are beautiful. And they come up in places you didn't plant them, but I have, I have several now. Now, one of them did not bloom, but I have uh, two different color pink ones, and this orange one did not come back, and I don't know why, because it, it was the first year I had a calla lily, it was white. I went out every day to check on it. Went out one day, and what was there? A deer had eaten the whole top of it. Most everybody's familiar with hen and chicks. That's another little tiny one. Uh, doesn't require a lot of water. It will have a lot of chick babies. And then you can have cut those chick babies off and make more. And this is what is called a succulent. I have not left mine out in the winter, although you're supposed to. I bring mine in. But this is another precious tiny. There are a lot of great sedums. This is called lemon ball. And if you'll notice, the print matches the color of the leaves. But this is a, it, 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 it's a, it doesn't get very big. And I really, I like the growth on it. But I love the color. It's sort of a chartreuse. And you, you forget to water it. It doesn't go all wilty on you. And it makes a wonderful container plant. Here is one of the wonderful tiny sedums. It's called Ogon. And the leaves are very tiny, and they are bright, bright, bright chartreuse. And probably of all the sedums I have, this would be my favorite. Now, this is called Angelina, another beautiful chartreuse sedum. I grow all of these in pots because they make nice highlights in the sun, and I just put them around the yard, and they don't seem to mind if I forget to water them. And these, these can stay out over, over, the, over the winter. I don't, I don't bring them in. The succulents I bring in, these sedums I don't. OK, going to just tell you right up front, the label for this sedum disappeared. But I had to bring it because I love the colors. I love the purple in it and the green. And this is as big as it gets. And it's great if you have an urn that sometimes doesn't do very well because it's hard, hard to keep them watered. This is great in an urn. And I wish I could tell you the name, but the label seems to have vanished. Everybody loves a columbine, one of the sweetest of the tinies. Now, one thing about a columbine, you can get hundreds and hundreds of them, and they'll all be covered with tiny flowers. But I love them and you don't even know where they came from, and all of a sudden you've got a purple one, a pink one, a blue one, a white one. I haven't had a yellow one yet, but we, t we cut them down when, the, the, when they start getting the little disease that you get from columbine caterpillars or whatever starts crawling all over them and leaving white lines. But if you don't have columbines in your yard, you need to have them. They are carefree. They don't seem to care if they have water or fertilizer. The biggest thing is just cutting them back when they're done. And they do go to seed. And I let mine go to seed so that I'll have some for next year. And then sometimes people will ask, and I'll just give them the seeds. Um, this is a new thing that I'm getting into. They're called Carexes, and this is Carex Everillo. And again, it is my favorite color. It's chartreuse. This can stay out all year. It prefers some shade. And it does like to be watered. And it will grow about three times as big as this. But when you compare it to camellias and rhododendrons and big old maple trees, it's still a tiny. And when I talk about this one, there's all, there are lots of different carexes. I have bought some that were not as hardy as this one. This one really, really stands the test because I've got lots of them and I put them all around my yard because I like the chartreuse highlight. Now, how can we all not love Lenten roses? I went through a collection stage on Lenten roses and my husband said, I don't like them. They all hang their faces down. 
So I had to crawl on the ground to take a picture of this. But this is one I got in a nursery in Atlanta, and it is gorgeous. The fancy ones do not reproduce like the small, like the regular ones that everybody hellebores that we're all used to that come out one color and eventually turn to green. Those reseed and can reseed everywhere. This one is more ladylike, but certainly beautiful. Here is another one, um, rue. Now, I read there there's a false rue and another kind of rue, and I was unable to figure out whether this was a false rue or just the regular rue. So I'm going to say that this is the regular rue, and I got this plant from Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Roberts, excuse me, probably 20 years ago. It does not spread and make great big mounds. I wonder if it may not be completely happy at my house, but it is what's called a woodland plant, so it's great to layer under bigger plants. And I don't really do anything for this except the lubber grasshoppers ate the leaves on it this year. Now, everybody knows what gar is. I mean, everybody. I mean, it's sold, it's common, but look at the flowers. They are dainty and dear and charming and on top of that the bees love them and will actually get on top of them and the whole flower will just sort of wave in the breeze as the bees uh, as the bees take a drink or check on the pollen unfortunately gar can get kind of leggy about this time of the year and some of them die back so on monday i dug up about 200 of them because they had just seen better days but when they're in their peak they are a dainty charming plant the little flowers on them and just watch the bees this is elizabeth lawrence phlox it has a story behind it i got it from jason powell at petals from the past and he told me it came out of a very famous gardener by the name of Elizabeth Lawrence. I believe she was in North Carolina, and he propagated it, and I got some. It's not like the regular phlox. It's, it's very, very different. Uh, some years it might look better than others, but it, it's really beautiful, and it fits on the charming list. Blue-eyed grass. If you want to talk precious, this is precious. I got it years and years ago, and I lost the tag. So I didn't know what it was, but every year it bloomed with the little blue flowers on it. So I started, I wanted to include it in my PowerPoint, but I said, I've got to know what it is. So I Googled blue flowers, and there it came up, blue-eyed grass. Now, the one at my house has been there for five years. I planted one at the pocket park, and it died in a week. Can't tell you what it likes, maybe more sun, maybe better soil, more drainage. But if you're looking for something petite for your garden in blue, because we all know blue's hard to find, this is it. This is your baby. I started collecting pitcher plants too. You're beginning to see a trend. I like to collect plants. I have a hard time buying more than one of a plant but I started collecting pitcher plants. They are fabulous, interesting. The bugs fly down in the plants and then the pitcher plants eat them. They are carnivorous. And over on the left side, you will see the flower, but you can make yourself a small bog garden and put some pitcher plants in them and have a wonderful treat and have something really unusual, but they are carnivorous plants. Now. That does not mean we feed them pieces of leftover steak or hamburger. They, they make their own food. They catch flies and any other kind of bug that happens to fall in, but you don't feed them. And they do not like fertilizer. If you want to kill them, fertilize them. What I did was I took a great big giant pot. I couldn't believe it, how big this pot was, and I mixed it with sand and peat moss. And I drilled the holes around the top and a few around the bottom, and I made a bog garden. I probably had about 50 pounds of sand and peat moss in it, but it's beautiful. 
Uh, this is gardenia radicans. This is the only one that I was not growing in my yard. I included it because it is a baby gardenia. It's more of a ground cover and it's a miniature of a full-size gardenia. And it is a great ground cover, but when I went out to take my pictures, mine had already finished blooming. I've had some trouble with some of mine. I don't think they were happy where I had them, but I've got one that is happy. It's just never quite spread like this, but if you want a baby gardenia, this is it. Okay, as long as we're talking about tiny plants, I'm going to go back. I picked the gardenia radicans because it is the miniature of the big gardenia. So we're going to talk about miniature and dwarf plants. I don't know if any of y'all have a dwarf dutzia. During the tornado, mine all moved to a different spot above ground. And I had a very good friend that came over and she helped me dig them up and we moved them. I also have the regular dutzia, which gets about eight or nine feet high. This one gets about three feet high and three around. And it also is a deciduous, but the flowers are really, really beautiful. And I used it because it has dwarf. It's a dwarf or a big one. Little Princess Spirea. You can guess why I use this one, because it's called Little Princess. Uh, there are big Spireas and little Spireas. This is almost a ground cover Spirea. It has beautiful pink flowers on it. And mine probably is about five feet around, but it's only maybe two or three feet tall, and it has these luscious little pink flowers over it. I also have one that's chartreuse, but it didn't have any blooms on it the day I went out to take it. And I do sometimes cut it back, and I do sometimes dig up some of it if it goes past its boundaries. Why have I chosen this one? Because its name is Tiny Princess. This is a camellia with little tiny flowers. And she earned the word tiny she has got probably got hundreds of little pink flowers in the long yellow stamens. I went out one day and a little princess had come out of the ground and I shrieked. And so I got some stakes and I put her back and that's been about eight years ago and she's been going strong ever since. But this thing is a beauty. And she doesn't, she has very nice manners. She probably, she does get maybe about six feet tall, but she doesn't get big and giant fat. She's kind of a compact grower, so she can fit most anywhere. This is also one of my favorite plants. When Jimmy Roberts was around, I used to go visit him very frequently. And he told me about Chinsan Dwarf Azalea. It is a satsuki. Satsukis are like a great big wash tub. Mine is probably about three and a half feet wide and maybe two and a half feet tall. And Shinsan blooms in May, so it always misses the early, the early frosts that we get in April or March that kill the, uh, the, uh, the regular azalea that we're all used to, the indica azaleas. This one blooms much, much later, so you always get the flowers. Well, I have kind of a nice story about Jimmy. He called me up and he said, Sherry, I've got something for you. It's some satsukis, and I'm going to keep them for you. Well, I didn't get out there, and I didn't get out there, and all of a sudden, Jimmy was gone. And I was horrified because one of Jimmy's last things that he said to me was, I want you to have these satsukis. So when their nursery had their going out of business sale, I went and I talked to his wife and I said, Jimmy has four plants put up for me to buy and I know exactly what they are. And it didn't even matter that I already had one exactly like it. Now I've got four more. But each time I walk out, I remember Jimmy and his story about the Shinsons. 
this is a new plant that I just got. Actually, I got it at the Botanical Gardens, and it is a silver dollar dwarf hydrangea, a paniculata. There are a lot of paniculatas, and normally they are huge, but this one said dwarf, so I've got it living in a pot. And to the very right, you will see the other flower lover in my yard. That is Miss Misty Rose. All my dogs are always named after a flower, and she really enjoys running around the backyard and smelling the flowers. And so that particular day, she was just coming up the path, and I thought, well, I'm going to include her in this picture. So this, I don't have any space in my yard. That's another thing. People who can't stop buying plants eventually don't have any room, so they have to put them in pots. So I'm always looking for something that will grow in a container. And here's this silver dollar dwarf hydrangea. I said, perfect, perfect for a pot. And over there to the left is a whiskey barrel full of white begonias. Now, I didn't include white begonias in my PowerPoint, but that's an, another very dear, dependable flower. You can stick it anywhere in your yard except the hot sun. It'll bring some cheer. Okay, you see why this one's here. This is little lime hydrangea. It's another paniculata, meaning it can take full sun. There's also limelight which is its mother or its father, I'm not really sure. Limelight can get about 12 feet tall, and it's got huge, huge panicles on it. So I bought this one, Little Lime, to try it out to see what it would do, and I put it in at the pocket park, and it's been there probably three years. Now, the one at my house, I don't think it's, it said Little Lime, but the flowers on it are huge, and so I'm not sure if it was mismarked, but the rain beat it down, but this is definitely little lime. Okay, the champion of the world for plants that say dwarf are Japanese maples. There are thousands of cultivars of Japanese maples, and when I say thousands, I mean thousands. Dwarf Japanese maples are not a baby of a big one. They are their own person. They have their own characteristics, their own growing styles, their own blooming styles, their own colors. They are slow-growing compact trees. They have much smaller leaves. I have one that's three feet, and then I've got some that are about eight feet. But everybody has their own personality. This is Olson's Frosted Strawberry that will get six feet in 10 years. Well, my Olson's got really unhappy. I don't know whether it was drought or heat, but every leaf got burned to a crisp. So I dug it and moved it because I love this strawberry color. But as with most Japanese maples, they will turn color from spring to summer to fall they will put on a different array of colors. Okay, this is my baby, Kiyohime Dwarf Japanese Maple. This is my bush. It says it's two to three feet high and three to four times as wide. Uh-uh. That thing, I went out and looked at it very carefully. I think it's more like nine feet wide, but it is only about two feet tall. It is... It is, again, one of my favorites, and they also have one of the botanical gardens. They grow theirs in full sun. I grow mine in part shade. Drift roses. Everything is about drift roses, and this is called popcorn. A drift rose is a baby knockout rose, but not really the same. But if you're used to knockouts, this was done by the same people. It's hard to find drift roses this year. <coughs> Excuse me. I saw one at one of the big box stores, and they really looked awful. So I wouldn't tell anybody to go get them. I got this several years ago at Blooming Miracles, and it I can't tell you how beautiful it is. It's popcorn, it's white, and it turns kind of yellow, and it it gets like a great big wash tub, and 
don't know, it's one I have red and pink and coral, but I believe this one's my favorite, and I wanted some more this year, but I didn't find any. Now, how do we talk about little flowers without talking about a viola, which is an annual? I, there's a viola, and if you want to get even tinier, there's Johnny Jump Up. And if you want to get bigger, you go to pansies. I prefer putting the violas in pots. I think they fill out really nicely. And unless the deer get them, they'll last you till it gets hot. But I mean, in January, you go out and these things will blind you with the color. My top number of pansies and violas to bring home was 450. And my husband took a picture of me sitting in all those violas and pansies because he knew that no one would believe that anyone could bring home that many plants. And I had a beautiful container full, and I was showing them to somebody on Saturday. When I came out on Sunday, the deer, who also loved them as well as I did, had eaten every one. But it won't stop me. I'm already talking about when I'm going to plant my pansies. And one, there's two or three pansy tips. They don't like the heat. So I never plant mine before October 22nd. They don't real crazy about the drought. You can't plant them too deep. Spray them with some kind of a deer spray and give them some slow release fertilizer. And my favorite thing to do in about February is to go out and deadhead them. Because if you pinch off the spent blooms, they bloom much better. And this is my January and February therapy. But even if you can only have containers of them, put lots of them out. Like I go to Birmingham to a place called Collier's, who has every color in the world of violas and pansies. And I, I'm almost frozen. My car is completely filled up, and the dog who's come with us has to move all the way to the corner because I can't leave a pansy behind. And now, Alicinia, we're coming to the end, and I'm getting, uh, I, I talked much faster, or I didn't have a lot of input from people, but narrow leaf zinnia is another charmer. This is an annual. There's, this one does not get powdery mildew. The deer don't bother it. It's drought tolerant, but it will wilt. And this is a great in the ground, or I put it in all my pots to be cheerful. And there's the narrow leaf zinnia, and then you can move up to the profusion zinnia. And then you can move up to the regular zinnia. As a matter of fact, I just came from Downings, as I told you, and I bought a big bag of zinnias, and they were out of all their flower seeds. They said they had never seen so many people come in and buy flowers. So we all know that hope is a flower, and we all know it's good for us. So I'm getting ready to plant some. And that is it for this and, and Teresa has a question. I hope it's not too hard. Uh-oh, she has two questions. If you want to put them down on that table, I will get them from you so you don't trip over the wires. Okay. All righty, thank you. We have a question from a wonderful master gardener, Lynn Webb. She wants to know how tall Elizabeth Lawrence flocks get, and I'm going to say about eight inches. And I need to remind y'all that there's tons of things going on in the library, that COVID has not stopped the library here. They've gone on, they've got all kinds of programs on Zoom, they have got book clubs, they've got all kinds of activities for your kids who may be going crazy by now, running around the house, but they've got trivia and just all sorts of interesting things for them to do. Now, September 1st, I'm going to be here again via Facebook, and we're going to be talking about Made in the Shade. Some of these same plants are shade lovers because we layer them, but when you start talking about shade plants, the sky's the limit, and I bought a book 
I guess I copied it, it was called Made in the Shade, and I was surprised how many plants that I thought were sun lovers they planted in the shade. But I thank anybody that watched this, and you can, if you missed it today, you can go to the library's Facebook page, or you can go to their YouTube page and watch it again. And for all the master gardeners who are looking for CEUs, this is a perfect way to get them, and you can watch them whenever you want. I haven't learned Zoom yet, and I've watched some, and I thought, hmm, not sure I'm going to get there or not. I'm, I'm not up to watching Zoom, but this is good, and we want to thank Teresa for having me and catering to my, to my strange COVID anxiety by just letting me do this on, on Facebook instead of having a room full of people. Yes, it's more fun for a room full of people, but when you, in these times, you're just glad to be able to reach out to people no matter what the way. So please join us again, and if you have a question, you can always reach me through the Aniston Star, or you can send a question to Teresa at the library.